Now, let's listen to the Paul. He's from Glasgow, Scotland. Paul is an open source contributor, public speaker, trainer, and consultant by trade. Paul Dragunas will take the time to share with you everything he has learned along the way, from best practices to clever tools and techniques you may never have heard of, to what works and what doesn't, to making the most of PHP 8. Paul, the microphone is yours. Thank you, uh, whoever was talking there. Uh, I just want to make a photo for Twitter, if that's all right. All right, one, two, three. Hey! Thanks, guys. We'll put it up. Okay. And I just get my clock up. Start. Okay, let's go. Um, people in the back, can you hear me okay? Can you understand me? I try my best English, right? Every day I'm trying, so bear with me, okay? Um, okay, let's go. This, uh, this talk could be for hours, it could be for days. You know, it's like training and it's consulting and advice. So if uh, the slides will be online, the recordings will be online, but of course, if you don't get any chance to speak now, I will be at the bar all evening with you guys, all right? So we can talk there. Um, I was speaking at the, the other conference in Poland and May, May time in Poznan. Who here was at the conference in Poznan? Okay, maybe 10%, that's good. Lots of new faces. Uh, who has maybe heard of me before on the internet or uh, seen a talk or anything like that? Okay, good, Not lo so new faces. This is me, I do these things, okay? Um, and I do PHP things and open source things. I'm part of the Linux Foundation, CD Foundation, uh, and I organize Scotland PHP. I'm also part of the PHP UK conference team as well. So if anybody wants to go to, uh, it's in London in February. So if you're there, I'll make sure you're there. And uh, this here, everybody's saying bullshit on the internet. PHP is dead. It's not dead, all right? Tell them they're wrong when you see them, okay? Um, and if you, anyone wants, if any slides or anything, you know, people take photos, that is, you can tweet me there because it'd be great to, you know, have some pictures as well if uh, anyone takes any. But despite all of the things I do in my career, every day I still feel like this, okay? And I hope you do too. Also this guy, I am this guy. The more I know, the more I know so little, basically, right? And if you do not feel like this, then you're not trying hard enough and you're pushing yourself hard enough, okay? And that's what I want to say. Uh, I used to do all these coding, programming things. Now I'm a CTO. I, in the pandemic, it's COVID, a lot many people had to lose their jobs. I'm basically created a company, technology company, to help technology companies find technical people rather than recruitment agencies, which is non-technical companies. And it is an end-to-end -end engineering solution. We uh, basically, you're engineers, you're in companies, you're here there to code, you're not there to interview lots of people, right? It's a big waste of time interviewing everybody. So I said, what if I could have a technical team of engineers that could find an interview and then give you guys uh, lots of your time back, right? You can make more money, but you cannot make more time. And that's what we do. If it's of any interest, any of your companies are looking to hire engineers in Poland or anywhere else, just give me a shout. If you know my name, you know the URL. Thank you. This talk is basically, I'm giving you information in the format of a case study. Case study meaning we took a customer for the past two years, a big uh, uh, transformation project. We take them from a 10 year old legacy system. It was Symphony 1. With some, they tried to modernize it with putting Symphony 2 things in there and it was not a great idea. So they also had this guy who is using, Pro, remembers Propel? Anybody? Awesome, it's active record, it stinks. Don't use it. Uh, it, was, it was PHP 7, so they tried to modernize it so much but they could not get further because the, the rest of the, the whole system was the old system and they tried to make the current system move forward. And I know that's a common technique. I don't recommend it if you are, have a very legacy system that will just not be able to take forward into the future. And so this talk is about the, the, the tips and tricks and techniques on how to get modernization things to happen in your businesses and companies at a small level, small changes, rather than big bang change. That's very hard and very expensive. And uh, the, 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 tens, the legacy system had serious decay and crazy amount of technical debt that I didn't even want to touch it. Uh, the tech that we're using, uh, we, we, I, we brought to the company is this. So you'll see some of this in the talk. This is an example of what good looks like, right? I hope you agree. 
And these are some of the methodologies that we took into the company from an architectural perspective, how to structure the code, these types of things, and more. Uh, ubiquitous language, meaning uh, domain-driven design, meaning that the language of the business people is the, is the language of the code. It is, is matching, right? And event storming is basically workshops, how you do, you, you define the language. You speak with the business people, the analysts, the customers, and get them to, to find the language. And, and because sometimes tech, the, 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 key, the, the language of the technical systems is not the same as the, the, the customers, right? And it's the key, uh, separated. So event storming is just workshops where you basically do fancy things and mapping, and then you can start to write TDD and write code. It is a pure reflection of the business. And so that's the, the summary of how we approached it. The problems with the current systems, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is you cannot release new features. It's very tricky to find bugs. Observability of the system, how it's working, what's happening is very hard. And uh, developers have all the technical debt in their brains, not in, on paper. So trying to hire new people, good luck, right? Um, so what was once a legacy and challenging code base uh, will, uh, basically will now rise from the ashes in majestic fashion. And hold on. Uh, I reordered my slides. Um, the goal of the system was to transform it into a cutting edge platform to deliver high business value and in, to, to allow the, the software developers and the technical team to innovate and deliver features easy and quickly. You couldn't do that with the current system, so we had to create a new system. But you, if you have two systems, it's hard to, you know, they're completely separated. So how do you link them and how do you make change happen over time easily, not hard ways? Um, and also, we wanted to be easy to test the system, debug it, deploy it, and monitor it, right? That's what we all want in our companies. With mini but this strategy was to have as little infrastructure and DevOps changes as well. They say, oh, we don't want two systems. We want one system. And I said, OK, we'll, get you, we'll give you one system. But your current stuff, it will think it's one system. It doesn't really know the difference, right? And you keep all the CI, CD stuff. And so that was the goal. Pretty ambitious, but we did it. So introducing what I called Project Phoenix. This guy. So there he is. The characteristics is back end only, keeps the same database. It's not a new Git repository. And the, but the code will live independently from the current code. Right? There was a, a balance, a compromise. We're using something called Strangler Pattern to lift and shift domain code. So the legacy system has domain code, that's, ver that's the business rules. We want to keep the business rules and we want to just kick everything else in the, in the trash, right? So strangle pattern allows you to do that. If you're not familiar with that term, it's very popular. You can Google that and learn some more about that to see how you could apply strangle pattern in your companies. Conceptually, this is the split. The, the office is the name of the legacy system. That's what they called office. And I created Phoenix. So that's just letting you know that's the language of the, the talk. Um, and let's say how you're making API calls or something and it's hitting the system. So it's hitting the same point. But in the back, it's going, oh, well, it's going to go A or B in the background. But everything else on the surface, it has no idea. And let's say you're going to create a contact. Where's the, where's the thingy? <laughs> cool. Um, contact, create a contact, which means like add someone to the address book, right? Uh, create a, create a, a person in the system. Um, so at the moment, it goes here and goes to database. And, we, and V4, so down here is the, I don't know if you can see that, it's version 4 and version 2 of the API, right? So that's standard stuff. It goes easy, right? It goes straight to here. But how do you start deleting old code and replacing it? And get, how do you get new code into an old system, right? Now, you don't want to take the, the new code and put it into the old code, because then they'll be the same system. They will conflict. They will not like each other, right? So strangler pattern, you will see this is the old system making API calls to the new system. And you can take hundreds and hundreds of th and thousands of lines of code, and you can effectively just delete all of that and replace it with like one line. And that one line of code will just make an API call out to the new guy. You see? So when you add the feed, you, you, you take the domain uh, code to the new system, and then you have a, a client, an API client, right? And in this case, we used Open API. Who's here is you, familiar with the Open API? Awesome about four, half the room, awesome. Uh, the reason Open API, you'll see this in the talk, is important because um, it's a specification. You can do smart, intelligent things with that to make your lives easier and get more confidence. So this is kind of the, again, a, a deeper view. We're going to get deeper and deeper as the talk goes on, right? So this is just Nginx. This is the FPM. And this is an, a Phoenix FPM. So what I did is I separated the FPMs. 
separated the runtimes, separated the processes, because they use different memory. The new system, of course, will be modern, PHP 8. It'll be very fast. But the old one, so again, different FPMs, different runtimes, different extensions and all that. So that is also a good strategy that I can recommend, is just to completely split it. But on the surface, you can make it in here, right? Um, now, details aside, just look at the, the shapes. Don't really worry about the text. But and the user tries to create a contact, and they go to the old system as normal. And then eventually, the old system will make an API call out to the new guy and then to the database, right? That is maybe an intermediary step. You don't want to be there in the end, but that could be a compromise. And it's a good compromise, because you can literally just delete thousands of lines of code with an API call, right? This is, the out, this is what you want to get to, and this is what we went to, right? Effectively, the old guy dies, and the API call goes to the new guy. Again, same database, so the same result will happen. Um, the new thing at the bottom here, I don't know if you can see at the back, is just means new Angular front end. They were already using AngularJS, so we said, oh, I'm not solving that problem. So you can keep Angular. Um, and so the idea is they had a Symfony server-side rendered system. So the, old, the current Office system is doing all the rendering. I'm not fixing that, right? But what you can do is just drop in like a little bit of uh, AngularJS like a, a markup, and then it will do something. So if you can imagine, you have a user interface. There's lots of buttons and drop downs and shiny things, but they're all old system. And what you can do here, and what I recommend, is this is where you start. You start at the front end, right? And you can literally replace a button. Maybe that button used to be rendered by Symfony 1 or the old system. But now the new system in Angular is rendering at. So it looks the same. It's the same CSS. But when you click it, it makes an API call rather than a post. Maybe it was already making an API call, but it was making API call back to the current legacy system. And so basically, that button is the same, but it will make API call to the new system. And that's the key thing about trying to get refactoring and modernization into your teams. Or the, or the businesses, is button by button, you can modernize. You don't need to do page by page. You don't really need to do system by system. You can, if you can get it right, that's how you get it. And that's how you make, that's how you make movement into a company. Because all the, the, the managers and the own business owners, they're asking, well, how much time is it going to cost? How much money is it going to cost? That's a common question. It's hard for us as techies. We say, well, it will cost a lot more money, but it's worth it, I promise. But they don't care, right? Let's be honest, they don't care as much as we care as uh, techies. So if you can sit there and, well, let's, let me just replace that one button or that one form. How about that? Let's take it from there. So that's where I reckon the, the successes I've had in my career, and I'm sharing that with you to say that has worked for me and maybe it'll work for you if you start at the button. So maybe just go back to your company and think, how can I make the tiniest change? But it's a completely new thing if you have legacy systems. Who here is currently working in a company where there is legacy system? Okay. <laughs> Everybody. Okay. This is just the concept Nginx, Nginx config. There's two FPMs. The current guy is on nine, port 9000. The old guy, the new guy is 9010. So it's just a port on the same machine. So when they have to communicate, when the, 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 if the legacy wants to contact a new system, then uh, there is no network traffic. It's talking to itself. You could make this a Unix socket as well, right? But I use TCP or whatever. Um, Remember, don't let the new system talk to the old system. That's the, op that's the opposite way of life, right? It will mess you up. It's, all, it's only one direction, and that's good. This is basically what I was talking about. Uh, this is a, the, 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 there is two Docker containers, yeah? They have the current Docker container, which has the Nginx and the FPM, and it's in production, right? But the, a Docker container has the PHP runtime. So the old system would be PHP 5 or PHP 7, and the new system would be PHP 8, right? So you want two Docker containers. It means you can iterate and make changes and, and advancements on the new Docker container without worrying about the old guy. But then you think, well, now I have two problems. I only want one container in production. I don't want two. So in Kubernetes, which is, this is a Kubernetes example, Kubernetes has this thing called a pod. Who here is familiar with what it means a pod? OK, maybe 15% of the room. Uh, Kubernetes means a pod is a deployment, an application, but inside of that you can have many containers. But you don't deploy containers, you deploy a pod. It's quite good, right? So basically, they already had a, had a pod with the one container. And so I, it was very easy for me to just copy and paste a piece of YAML code for Kubernetes in the Helm charts and just say, the Docker image for this guy, I'm not touching it in the copy, paste, change the, the, uh, the Docker image name to Phoenix, bam. It just deploys. Everything, the infrastructure, CI/CD, it doesn't change. 
in your CI CD pipelines, you just need to build one more image, right? Remember before I was saying the code base is the same, the same Git repository, right? So how do you have separate, separate systems, separate Docker containers, but it's the same repository? Well, what I did is I just had a directory in there called Phoenix. And when it's doing the current system, it's doing the Docker build, and it's you know, building up the code for production, and just saying like, okay, do what you're doing, but see that, you know that uh, Phoenix directory? Don't touch that guy. He's not part of your code that you're going to production with. And that was it. Very simple, basically. And then vice versa, when it's do building the Docker container for the, the new Phoenix system, then it just does you know, CD Phoenix. And then it does everything inside of the Phoenix. So it's kind of like two systems with their own stuff, but it's in one repository. And that's important because everything in, your, in the company is currently just running off like that one repository. That, so everything just flows, right? All the stuff, all the Jira boards, all the project management, it's all hooked up against one thing. So that's kind of how I resolve that. So minimal change into the business. If you can get the minimal change, then you get maximum technical capabilities. This is the hexagonal architecture, domain-driven design. Who here recognizes what this looks like? Anyone see this before? Uh, thanks. And the reason I'm asking for your hands is I don't want to teach you things you know, but I also don't want to skip things you don't know, right? Um, this is how you architect the cleanest systems that have the least technical debt, yada, yada. It's called hexagonal architecture because the shape is a hexagon. You may know this as onion, right? onion uh, architecture or layered architecture also, different names. This is from Domain Different Design World, okay? Anyway, um, this is what a module looks like or a symphony bundle, right? A modular system. Before they had, they had Symphony 1, you know, other systems like, like say Laravel and other frameworks, they maybe just have one big thing um, rather than modularity. So we went with, of course, modular system. Uh, and this is an example of thingies. And, say, and if you cannot read that, don't worry, because I, I will zoom in later. This is an example, a kind of example of the structure of a, a module. And what is a module? A module is actually a piece of the domain of that business. So it could be invoicing, payment, you know, authentication, like users, other dashboard or something like right. So you, the, the trick is when you're modernizing systems, you you split it up per domain, not per logical code blocks, because the boundaries shift and change over time, and the code will no longer reflect what you need. So my so my from a, so my recommendation is stick to business language and business domains first, and then you can work your way in, right? And if the business makes changes in their language and decisions, that's cool, because the code will be exactly what they expect it to be, because the, the, the business people cannot see the code. So if you keep it like that, everybody kind of happy. Uh, this is testing, right? So I'm going to pause, take a little break, uh, and I wonder if anybody has any thoughts or any questions about uh, what I've been saying so far, and if so, I get to throw this at you. And if not, that's fine. Okay. So, testing. This is the important part, right? Who here knows about ice cream cone testing? It's basically what you're, it's the opposite of what you should be doing, but many companies, it's hard to read. Manual testing is at the top, yeah? And then we have automated tests in the middle. Uh, that's not what you want. But that's that. If now you know how to express this problem to people, once you know this name, you say you're doing ice cream cone testing. Let's let's flip that to the testing pyramid, which is what we should all be aiming for, right? I wanted to break this down for you because this is also the smart stuff we did, not just refactoring and, and nginx fpm. Can I zoom in this? Can I zoom? No. Yeah. I'm not I'm not touching it. Okay. The clever thing we did here was. B hat is on the left, uh, acceptance tests, right? Many people, when you learn or talk about acceptance testing, they think like APIs or user interfaces, right? And what is an acceptance test? An acceptance test is a business value test. So on the left, it says business value tests and technical tests, right? So in your integration or functional test, that's just code, you know, things running, databases uh, persisting and reading and writing. But um, the business don't care about that. They care about seeing the features that the customer and the language that the customer and the business managers will see. So Behat is obviously an amazing tool and it's BDD is a great invention. The challenge I see in many companies over my career is people are using Behat to try to call user, user interfaces or APIs. There's nothing wrong with it, but you can do better than this, okay? What you can do is if you're doing domain-driven design, 
you have application code, infrastructure code, and domain code. Infrastructure code, by the way, it means like third party frameworks and libraries. You know, if you're doing PayPal or Stripe, you know, inf that's infrastructure, it's not your code, it's another library. But you wrap it in something, and then you put that thing safely into your code, right? An abstraction, an interface, okay? Once you separate the, lo the logical layers, it means that you can start to swap things around, or you can access just the domain, which what is inside the domain? The business rules, you know? If I go to the shopping cart and I add two things into my shopping cart, I get a discount. That's a business rule, right? Uh, and so on and so on. So what we did is we used, because we did domain-driven design, we were able to write our behat tests, not to go over the user interface or over the API, but literally just load up classes, right? Literally a class that's like a domain class, like a, a create a customer or add a payment or do stuff, right? The domain classes are structured like this. And so now the speed of the BDD tests are like unit tests. So who here is using Behat in their companies or before in the past? Okay. So you may have noticed that when you run it, it's cool, but it's slow maybe. And you're like, I want the feedback, I want the feedback. And you're like, uh, I don't want a unit test because it's faster. What I'm saying is you can, if you do it like this, you can just literally, behind the, the, the BDD lines, the steps, you can just load code. So you get all the business value and all the rules checked, but at the speed of unit testing. And for me, that's the holy grail. And that's what we should try to achieve in our teams so that we can write code and write rules or change the rules and run it without waiting for APIs and UIs because it's, you know, time is money, right? So that is a thing I want to highlight. And if you're interested in this more, you can ask me after or tweet me or something and I will send you some links to techniques on how to do this because that was, this is really good stuff. Um, modules, let me see. The other thing I wanted to talk about was in memory. This is a module and these are the tests. So again, I showed you the diagram. This is effectively what you will go if you go onto Wikipedia and it's like, what is the testing pyramid? So I'm trying to show you what the kind of tests, the code looks like behind that. So application domain infrastructure and then your tests and your three layers, acceptance, integration and unit, right? This, if you cannot read it, this is a clever thing we did with Behat, because Behat and Symfony are very well integrated together, okay? Who here is familiar with the concept called in-memory data repositories, or in-memory things? Okay, maybe 15% of the room. So the point, the uh, in-memory means, okay, a repository, a repository class, right? You, you say, here's something, uh, put it into the database, or, you know, read something from the database, and that's what a repository does, okay? Now, when you're running your acceptance tests, or you're running your integration functional tests or, wh or wh whatever. Um, yep. Um, by default, it's slow, right? Because it's actually going to the real database, MySQL, whatever. So your test suites. So you, all these tests and all the, the, a the API tests, for example, right? If you're using Behat and you're going to the API, okay, cool. But you don't really care about the API. You're, you're trying to test the business rules in the inside, right? How do you get that feedback cycle to be faster? The, the concepts that you can re, you know, research it yourself is in memory databases. So it's in memory, it's RAM. So it's going to speed everything up. You don't change your tests, but with configuration, you can just swap things from a real database call to an, an in memory. So it will just add the records in, the, in, in, in RAM. So that's how you can also speed up, not just speed up your day, but speed up your refactors and speed up your modernizations. And that will impress the business because they're like, wow, you've modernized it and all the other tests are working. Great. So again, it's not just about how great your technology is, it's how, how, how quickly you can add value back to the business and impress them. But it's, again, there's challenges to do that. And so these are the kind of gotcha, the things you can do to get extra, um, extra movement, right? Uh, this is, uh, in Symfony, we have services.yaml, right? And then in Symfony, you can, now this thing called alias, right? You can change where it, where it will go. And so when, it, when you're loading the Behat suite, you can say, hey, don't, don't just run services.yaml, run services underscore test.yaml. And when you load services underscore test.yaml, it will put the overrides in. And these are basically overrides to say, when I want, you know, when I want this class, actually, it will be the in-memory. And if you can, you can, therefore, you can run behat tests or any tests uh, in the normal mode, but you can also run it in in-memory mode. So, for example, if you're building a feature and you're iterating on the changes on your feature branch, and then 
then you can just, it will switch in memory on because you don't, you're not changing the database. You don't care, you're changing the code. So you can flip the switch and everything becomes unit test speed. And then when you want to finish your feature or you're in the, middle, like the master branch or the main branch, you know, it's going to talk to MySQL and Redis and stuff, right? Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? This is an example of an in-memory repository. Our repository interfaces have read, persist, you know, that kind of stuff. And so at the bottom, it just says an array and put the thing into the array in the class. And that's it. The whole system has no idea. So it's, read, it's putting things in and it's reading them out. But it's going to read them in right from an array rather than a TCP connection over to a database. So when you're trying to modernize systems, I highly recommend this and highly recommend checking it uh, out further as well. Um, next, I wanted to talk to you about something that was really cool. I built this myself personally with a little bit of help. Uh, open API, right? I, I, maybe I asked you already, but who's who's a, who's using API? Open API? Who's not? Who's using it? Okay, not many people. Okay. Open API gives you a very as a YAML file, but it's a very precise schema of what it would what it wants when you make an API call and what you're going to get back, right? And you can reuse definitions of things like a like a like a definition of what is a customer, what is a payment, what is a transaction. You know, when it's like key val, you know, it's a string, it's a number, it's a date, stuff like that, right? Once you start using Open API, it's actually really beneficial because you find bugs. You find bugs uh, and stuff. Now, when we were adding the new, when we we're migrating the code from the old system to the new system, we're adding API endpoints because before there was not much API endpoints. It was legacy system, but now everything is an API. So what we're doing really, in effect, is we're just the new system is just API endpoints. Do 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 right. That's what we're building. But to give confidence to the consumer of those APIs, it could be others, other parts of the business, it could be external customers, systems, or it could be the legacy system talking to the new guy, right? So we need to have validation that what we are being received is good. Because if the legacy system is, if you're trying to, you know, like I said, the strangler pattern, and you're trying to have the old system make a call out to the new system, you may have bugs in the old system because the old system is unreliable. So maybe the new system actually gets sent the wrong stuff. And so at the point where you're receiving stuff on your controllers or your APIs, you can actually validate the payload coming in against a very good business facing spec, like spec files, right? And that in itself is value. What you can do inside of Symfony or any PHP system, PSR7, you know, Symfony, any PHP stuff, you can actually validate the payload against a schema file, right? So you're maintaining a schema file. But then what you can do is not just validate stuff, but you can generate API clients or SDKs for other parts of the company or other systems, right? Which is very cool. So I basically, you know, done some stuff, got a library, and there's an example of the Jenkins file, and but uh, it's a bash script, but generate PHP client and generate JavaScript client. Because now, remember, the front end is now has Angular like making uh, Angular buttons and stuff, and it's making API calls to Phoenix, right? So every time we change, add a new endpoint, or change the endpoints to the, the new system, well, what, you have to go and up, you know, add these things to the, all these front end systems? No, you make a change, you make a new API endpoint, you make an AP, open API spec, and you push, and then this, is, this uh, uh, pipeline receives the new spec, and it generates the clients every single time so that all systems are synchronized and you don't do any work because the generators will do the work for you. And that's really cool. And then you can publish these generators to new, let's say you have a headless system, right? And you have external companies and they're calling your APIs. They, don't, they have their own front end, they're calling your APIs. How do you keep it all synchronized, tested, checked and verified? And this is how you do it, right? These basically it generates and pushes to a, a, a Git repository, uh, which is a composer package. And so any system can now pull in your team or your, your, your system's, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 SDK, like API client. And that's good. That saved a lot of time, right? Not a, no manually doing things. Um, there, in PHP, there's libraries to again, validate incoming requests against the spec, but you can also flip that and you can check what you're, what you're calling. So like, bef like before you call something, you can also, in runtime, it will tell you, oh, sorry, this, is a, this should be a string, but you gave me a, a date field or something weird. So before it even 
tries to make the call out to somewhere, using this API client, it will fail. And everything is linked up, right? Anyway, there's more stuff, API clients. We're going to pause. OK. Danny, this is interesting. Happy to help. Um, obviously, you can talk to me for the bar as well. And we're going to, that's that so far. OK. Uh, basically, OK, cool. So we've got time. Every talk I do at conferences, I just talk the whole time. And I, there's no time for questions or conversations. And I feel like sometimes I don't know what you want to know until you ask me. So if there's anything that you want to know or to clarify, then now's a good time, basically. So oh, yeah. you need to you need to get this. You ready? Hi, Paul. Yo. Uh, thanks for your lecture. I think well, it was very interesting. Uh, one question out of curiosity. I'm not trying to be rude or something. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, on average, how much time do you spend on fixing this, these legacy systems, like in months, years? How much time have I spent building legacy systems? Yeah, yeah. 15 years? I mean, uh, I, per, per, I mean per project, per project. How, how much per time? Per project? OK. Yeah. Uh, on, on average. It's hard to make an average because every system is different size, right? That's the first thing. Um, how much time will the, the business let you spend on the system, like modernizing it, I suppose, right? Also, what does legacy mean? The, the, this, the second you deploy that feature to production, it's legacy. The second you press save, uh, you publish your documentation or the readme file, it's legacy, okay? <laughs> And the only way it will not be legacy if you have if your development processes are designed to have maintenance of these things, I suppose. So I can't answer the question directly because we have huge projects and we have small projects. But they're still legacy, though, right? Thanks. Do you have another question? Cool. Anybody else? You can throw it. Hey. Hey. So I have a question about the database model that you're not touching, um, there might be legacy as well. So how do you fix issues when the model is broken on the database side? You, you mean, so is the question, we did not have a new database and we touched, we, we both talked to the same database and how do we fix database legacy problems? Yes, if there are, yes. Yeah, we know this, it was a nightmare. We said, we're not touching the database, okay? And, and that's it? <laughs> But, but, um, but um, a serious answer would be, we were using domain-driven design, so the language of the business was in the code, in the repositories, right? And inside the repositories is where the nasty stuff was there, because the, the, the names of the fields in the database were completely wrong and, and stupid and backwards and, you know, really messed up stuff. And when we did the event storming workshops with the business and we were asking for the rules, and then we looked at the database fields and we're like, but what is this field? What is that field? And what is this field? And they're completely broken and wrong. So we basically encapsulated the problem in repositories. So you you know like you, uh, like uh, invoice create and invoice read, but under the hood the fields are all weird and just like you can fix that later. But the challenge is you can't fix it on the new system because it will break the old system. You don't want to touch the old system. You want to just spend as little time on that as possible. So that's kind of strategically why we did not touch the database because that means we have to change the legacy system in order to fix the new system. So we're wasting time because we don't want to spend time on something that we're going to set on fire later anyway, right? Did that answer your question? Yeah, so will you try to fix it after removing the old system? Sure, if you can. But if you want to fix it, then you have to go and fix, update the code on the old system as well. So it's a bit where you want to invest your time and the money. If you want to say to the business, hey, let's just pretend it's not there. <laughs> That's maybe a, a strategy, but yeah. Cool. If you can change it, if you can fix it, fix it. But for us, the system was so large and, and crazy that we said we have enough problems to, to worry about. Let's just uh, don't worry about that one for now. OK, thanks. Cool. Got more time.
we're, we're done. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, ladies.